record on this computer. Welcome everybody, thank you for joining this YouTube clip and thank you for joining this trailer for our uh, mastermind group, our top masterclass that Graham and I, Graham Jones and I, Graham will introduce himself in a minute, run twice a year in London, in a lovely hotel in London. The objective of it is part of our, uh, of our uh, South Bank think tank, which is a, a project Graham and I set up to help people that don't have the advantage that we had of uh, training centers, leadership, working for a large co company that gave us the benefit of, um, of their time, of their expertise, and spent a lot of money training us. The sad thing now is that people, younger people, don't get that. So uh, we designed this with uh, 17 sessions of 17 minutes, and we're gonna run through some of these, uh, some of these, uh, sessions with you now so i'm just going to stop the screen sharing as it didn't seem to be working graham which is interesting so here's the agenda <laughs> here's the agenda on my trusty flip chart leadership how to sell personal branding the work-life balance speed reading um tough questions win-win goals negotiating passive income the best presentation you can make, writing, influence, relationship management, body language, and questions and answers, all in 17 minutes. So we'll start with leadership. The real issue, ladies and gentlemen, with leadership is that uh, we all are leaders, and I don't think people appreciate that. You're a leader, whether you're leading your family, whether you're leading a small group of people, whether you're leading and setting examples on social media, these issues are really, really important, and therefore, um, we need to be thinking we are leaders, we are professional, we're doing things properly, and we don't need some of the leadership skills that we see on television, on the news, etc. So the real issue is leadership starts with you. We're all leaders, and on the course we go into it in some more depth. Graham, how to sell? Over to you. I we're going to sell a lot online uh, these days, which means that people are going to be seeing your prices and you certainly should be putting your prices because people disappear from websites if they can't see the price of what they want to buy. So people are looking to your website, no matter what you're selling, they want to know how much is this going to cost. So you need to put your prices on the website, but you need to use typography. And uh, it's very simple psychology of typography. If we see a, an item in big type, we expect it to be more expensive than something that's in small type. So here, an example of the way that uh, shops use this, there's a, a retailer in the UK called Asta, Walmart in the United States. They have these great offers, or they seem to be great offers. You see a sign for an item, a, a can of something for one pound or one dollar, and it says, you know, one pound each, one dollar each, or four for four pounds. Now, of course, that's exactly the same price. But what they do is they lower the type size of the four pounds. So psychologically, we think it's cheaper. And we end up buying four, and they end up making four times the money. So use typography to convince people that it's going to be cheaper than it really is. Because often you see people do things, you know, they cross out a sign saying, you know, was 25 pounds, now 20 pounds. And they put the 20 pounds in bigger type than the 25 pounds. And that means that psychologically, we think 20 pounds is more expensive. It isn't, of course. So we need to lower the type size. Use typography on your website when you're dealing with prices to convince people that the price is lower. Thanks, Graham. And then we move on to personal branding and unique selling points. This is something that people don't think about. Whether we work for ourselves or whether we work for a business, whoever employs us, wherever we get paid, wherever we get our uh, salary from or our income, we have to think about our own personal brand. I did a seminar on Zoom last week. People don't think about their personal brand on Zoom. They don't think about what the background is. They don't think about how they come across. Everything which is visible at any time is our personal brand. And the way we come across is vitally important. And it's a fantastic idea to list what your USPs are. Good old jargon for unique selling points. So they might not be unique selling points, but they're points where people will look at you and how you come across. Is it your expertise? Is it the way you come across? Is it your attitude? Is it your enthusiasm? Is it your work 
ethic? Is it the way you uh, gather people together? Is it your leadership skills? Is it the way you operate in a team? List them all down so you know what they are in whatever business you are. How does your personal brand come across? How do you come across to other people? Do you come across as expensive, worth hiring, worth picking up, etc.? Because every interaction is a USP, is a personal brand of us. Graham. Okay, the ne next thing on our agenda is how you might achieve a work-life balance. And uh, one of the things that you've probably read about recently is something called Zoom fatigue. People who are getting very tired watching the screen the whole time and getting fed up with just sitting in one place. This is uh, just an additional piece of evidence that modern technology interferes with what goes on up in your brain in really interesting ways for me as a psychologist, but actually in really dreadful ways in terms of your work-life balance. So there are some things we need to do in order to make sure that we relax and we don't stress out and we don't have any problems. And the most crucial thing of that is sleep. Sleep is really disturbed by visual technology by the technology that we use really disturbs our ability to sleep so the most important thing you need to do is stop using your mobile phone for the two hours before you normally go to sleep so if you normally go to sleep at 11 at night stop mobile phones and tablet uses after nine o'clock it's tough but you've got to do it that's really, really important. I didn't introduce Graham deliberately at the beginning because I knew he would tell you that he was a psychologist, he's a university lecturer, he's been a roadie for a pop group, he's an electrician. There's nothing that Graham doesn't know. If I don't know anything, I, re I ring uh, Graham. Number five, speed reading and mind mapping. I am a, prof I am a serial mind mapper. I mind map everything because you start at the introduction at one o'clock you, you, you go to the outro at uh, 11 o'clock and you put everything round and that's the way the brain works it all links up so to get things out of your brain before you do a presentation before you go into an important negotiation before you go for a job interview make sure you do that then i then i put it in into a list in order after that i get it out of my brain into a mind map and then a list into order and why do i include speed reading well in my book win-win i insisted there was a chapter in the book about speed reading because we have so much information now the faster we can read the faster we can pick it up the quicker we can do it the more effective we can be and the one tip to double your reading speed immediately is to use your finger like the teachers taught you when you were four at school or whatever so you read use your finger so that the eyes go straight across and follow the finger rather than stop at the gaps, which, is, which wastes 50% of energy stopping at the gap. So the psychological techniques of using your head, mind mapping, speed reading, brainstorming are hugely effective if we want to be efficient at what we do. And of course we do. Over to you, Graham. So in business, you're going to get asked lots of questions and there are some that you don't want to answer, not because you can't answer, because if you can answer the question, you will answer the question, presumably. Um, and there are some questions that you can't answer because you don't know the answer. And the easiest thing to do there and the most respectful thing to do is say, I don't know. And people will be perfectly happy if you don't know. You can always go and look it up and you can always come back to them later. But they'd rather you did that than kind of fudge your way. But there are going to be questions that you can answer, but you don't want to answer because it's not appropriate at that moment in time. So the most important thing to do there is to use a technique called the ABC technique. Uh, politicians don't use this, by the way. They use the IC technique, which means ignore and then try and control us uh, by telling us about something completely different. The ABC technique acknowledges the subject of the question. So if somebody is asking you about the quality of your product or the quality of your service, but you don't want to talk to them too much in detail about that at the moment, because that's not appropriate at the point of the discussion. Acknowledge the subject, talk about that subject, but create a bridge 
to where you want to be controlling the flow of the conversation. So it's called acknowledge bridge control. That's not what politicians do. They completely ignore the question and try and answer a different question. In fact, I've heard politicians say, that's not the question you should have asked me. That's not what I'm suggesting here. I'm suggesting talking about the subject. And the best thing to do is acknowledge the subject that people have asked you, create a bridge to where you want to be in control. That's A, B, C, and then use D, E, which means dangle an example. And so you talk about the subject, but don't answer the question and then give them an example about that subject. And they will then want to talk about that example, which means you haven't been answering the precise question because you're going to come back to that later on. Thanks, Graham. Win-win next. And uh, I know you can't see the bottom of the flip chart, but I will move it in a minute. Thanks for putting that in the, uh, in the box, Jill. Uh, a win for me and a win for you. Win-win has to be the name of the game in a negotiation, in a sale or an influence, because if you don't have a win-win, even if you close the sale or close the deal, the other person will remember that they lost. When people remember that they lost, they never forget it. The neurons stick there. That person uh, pulled one over on me. They tried it on. I didn't get a good deal. They pulled a fast one. We don't forget that. So a win for me, a win for you. But actually, there's a third win, a win for our ongoing business relationship because it costs seven times more to uh, attract a new customer than it does to upsell, cross-sell to an existing customer, getting a referral, getting an introduction, etc. So if you love your existing customers and you get a win, 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 then it's a win for me, a win for you, and a win for our ongoing relationship. And there's a great question you can ask people if you get stuck in a negotiation. We do want a win-win, don't we? And those of you that understand the psychology of questioning, that is a yes tank question. It's a statement followed by a yes tank question. We do want a win-win, don't we? And even if they don't want a win-win and they nod and say yes, their body language will show you that you've got a lot of work to do to find out what the issues are. Graham. So we come now to thinking about goal setting and how you might set your goals. One of the things that uh, you might be doing is uh, using uh, your computer to write down your goals and that's the last thing you should be doing. One of the things that we know about typing and anything that you're going to be typing is you're less likely to remember it. The reason for that is that the the type appears on the screen in front of you and you dissociate yourself from it psychologically. So one of the things that's really important if you want to achieve your goals is to use pen and paper. And I know this is going back in technology and you're going, well, there's fantastic goal setting technology out there where we can manipulate things and we can use those lovely mind mapping uh, pieces of software. Don't do any of that. Use pen and paper because when you're writing things down we know that you remember more and you engage much more with what you're writing down we disassociate ourselves from what we type because our brain is going it's the computer doing it not us whereas when the letters appear on paper you know you've created them and put them there the letters that appear on the screen have been created and put there by the computer so you are less connected to them so if you want to be sure to set goals that you're much more likely to achieve, pen and paper is your friend. It's great, isn't it? The old pen and paper. I carry it everywhere. I love it. I love it. Uh, we have two sessions on negotiating. The first one is to negotiate the best deal. And the th second one is to upsell via negotiation. So let's talk about negotiating the best deal. The first thing to do is to decide what you want to achieve from the negotiation. Once you've decided what you want and perhaps what the other side wants by asking questions, etc., then set your best position, target position, walk away position and what's your alternative position. Let me tell you that 95% of people don't do that before they go into a negotiation. They wonder what they might want. Let's get the best deal we can rather than setting clear goals and targets for what they want. What's the real dream position, best position? What's the target? That will be a really good deal. What's the walk away when I leave the deal? And if I don't get a deal or I don't, what's the consequences of 
the resources I've got, using them for something else, etc. Or maybe if we don't get a deal, the company will go into administration. What's the cost of that? Would I be better off if that happens, taking the worst scenario uh, possible? So that's the first session on, uh, on negotiation, which is all about thinking about what your best position, target position, walk away, an alternative position called by the Harvard Business School a BATNA, best alternative to a negotiated agreement. In the UK, I call it your alternative position. Graham, passive income. Passive income. Who would like a passive income? Who would like to just lie in bed knowing that the the cash registers of the internet are clicking away to bring you passive income. Well, <laughs> it's a nice dream and you probably get emails uh, every week as I do telling me that all I've got to do is invest in this program at $97 and I will soon discover how I can become a millionaire by tea time. Uh, and <laughs> none of those things work. Um, and But the best way to passive income is to actually do stuff that people want to buy. And so uh, knowing your audience, knowing precisely what they want, knowing the kind of things that they engage with, and then producing that in a variety of formats. So for example, if you're a business coach, then you can convert some of your best coaching kind of tips and sessions into things that people will download in a variety of formats. And it's the variety of formats that's important for passive income on the internet. A lot of people don't want to read, they want to watch video. And a lot of people don't want to watch video, they want to listen to the audio in their car. So the variety of formats is the key to passive income. You can turn whatever it is you do into lots of different formats. And there are a variety of things you can do. Uh, PowerPoint presentations that people flick through, whole different ways of turning your content into different forms and that's much more likely to produce your good passive income. Engage with people in the way they want to be engaged. There's one extra thing I want to say about that, Graham, is because another way of getting passive income is obviously investing in a property or investing in the stock market. But there is so much uh, going on at the moment, um, particularly, and I've been writing about this in my briefing, about Wirecard, third, worth $32 billion um, three weeks ago in administration today because the auditors didn't do their job properly. This, this makes me cross, but make sure, remember there's no such thing as a free lunch. If it looks too good to be true, it probably is. If you're buying a property, make sure you go and look at it. I know somebody who bought four properties in Cyprus never went to look at it once, didn't realize the plot of land was under an electricity pile on 10 miles from the beach. You can't make this stuff up, but I have to say people get conned. If, it's, if the interest rate is more than the going rate in the marketplace, then they have to be subsidizing it from somewhere else. So if it's too good to be true, it probably is. That's all I want to say on that. I've seen too many people lose their shirts. And uh, that really leads me on to negotiation again, doesn't it? Follow my negotiating system, which is 11 steps. They're easy. Apply whichever ones of these for the particular transaction you're doing. And remember, everything's a negotiating. It's negotiating with your kids, with your family, with your relatives, uh, with where you go on holiday, which restaurant you go to for your salary, etc. cetera. Uh, whatever it is that you're always negotiating. Number one, make sure you do your preparation. Number two, make sure your impressions are right when you start. Number three, ask good questions. Number four, listen carefully number five use all the psychological techniques that uh, graham and i share with everybody uh, number six read the body language because that's going to tell you lots of uh, information watch out for people not telling you the truth and uh, lying i've got a bit of an itchy nose at the moment so be careful of that uh, look out for the tactics the psychological tactics which are just there to reduce you down to your bottom line understand the tactics and the psychology of those tactics. Influencing skills I'm going to talk about uh, in a minute. Then we come to the haggling process, the bargaining, which you need to understand. If I do this for you, what will you do for me? Handling conflict, because there's always going to be some conflict in the negotiation, so learn how to handle that. And number 12 in the 11-step process, the extra one is confidence. You need confidence. If you go through that process, you mind map it, you'll feel confident. Good luck with your negotiations. Graham. 
So uh, we're talking about presentations and pitching now. And a few years ago, I was working for a large American uh, telecoms uh, corporation, and they had these slide decks that they prepared for all of their presenters around the world, people who are going to be pitching into businesses, and they couldn't understand why they had spent effectively millions preparing all this material, and their pitches were not working. And when I looked at what they were doing, it started with the history of the company, going back over 100 years to former companies that it had been. Uh, it told us that they just opened a new office in in, I don't know where, uh, somewhere in the world, uh, that was of no concern to the people in London that they were pitching to, that there was a new office in Vietnam, for example. So, uh, and I said, ditch all of that. Nobody's concerned about that. What they want to know is how you can help them. And so the most important thing about pitching is to start with the end in mind. What do you want your client to do as the result of your presentation? Not do you want to, what do you want to tell them? What do you want them to do? It may well be that what you want them to do is a bit more research. You may be, you, what you want them to do is sign on the dotted line that day. But what is it you want them to do? Do everything in your pitch to get there by knowing what it is that you need to do to enable them to do that. And once you've worked that out, your pitch will work very well. In other words, start with what they're going to do, not with what you want to tell them. I'm a massive fan and student of Robert Gialdini, the author of Influence, Science and Practice. And Robert Gialdini, 25 years ago, his studies showed there were six traits of successful influencing. And we all need to apply those all the time that we can do. Let's go through those very quickly. Number one, liking. Does the person like you or not? You're not going to influence somebody who doesn't like you. So do everything you can to build rapport, connect with them, mirror match their body language, etc., to get them to like you. Number two, reciprocity, giving people unconditionally something for nothing. Buying the first drink, buying the coffees, giving them your business card, uh, remembering things about them, where they went on holiday, etc., etc. Number three, authority. Do you come across as a person with authority? to do the deal? Do you dress properly? Do you look smart? Do you have uh, qualifications on your, on, on your business card? How do you come across with that authority? Dressing for success, really important in that area. Number four, scarcity. People want things they can't get hold of, which is why sale ends at five o'clock, et cetera. So uh, your time is scarce. Of course it is, all our time's scarce. Your skills are scarce, of course it is. So as you build up your skills and everything, you become more of a scarce resource. Number five, social proof, Gildini called it. Do other people say that you're an expert? How you come across? What's your testimonials on LinkedIn? What's your testimonials on your pitch document? And if you're sitting there thinking, oh, I'm a one man business, what does your website look like? How does it look to other people? And number six, commitment. Once people have committed to something, in the back of their minds, they feel really difficult about going back on it. So when you go to buy a car, as we talked about last week, the salesperson will say, if I get £100 off, which you've asked for, we do have a deal, don't we? Then he goes off to try and get the £100 and fictitiously, and he gets the £100 off. And it's very, very difficult to say no. Six traits of influence. Grant. Right. Derek, yeah, so the next thing uh, we need to think about is writing. Uh, this is our next session in our uh, top masterclass and writing for persuasion and profit is important because you may not realize it, but the most things you do involve writing. In fact, 80% of what we do on the internet is reading and writing. And so even though there's lots of video and lots of audio and lots of live sessions like this, actually you spend the bulk of your time reading and writing. And yet when you were at school, you were probably taught how to write compositions and essays uh, where you're taught to write to communicate in the modern business world probably not. And so the thing that you're doing most of is something that you probably have only picked up as you go along. The most important thing that you will ever write is going to be either the headline of the article or blog post or the front page of the report that you're writing or the subject line of your email. 
those are the most important things because those things determine whether or not people will carry on reading. Uh, when you talk to, say, newspaper owners and you, uh, you talk to newspaper managing editors, they will have probably one or two people whose sole job is to write what's called the splash, the splash headline, that big front page headline that grabs people's attention and makes them buy the newspaper. It's now the big headline at the top of their website. They will employ people who just do that, nothing else, all day spend on writing one thing. It's so important that they spend more money on that than they do on the writers for the next five pages. And so they've worked out over, you know, 200 years of newspaper publishing that that front page headline is fundamental to getting people to read the rest of the publication. That subject line is the most important thing in your email. If you're writing a really important email and you've spent half an hour writing the email, you probably need to spend an hour writing the subject line. It's that important. Called the next one relationship management. We called it originally making your customer feel important, which is absolutely vital. Uh, people have massive egos. Uh, who's the most person, first, most important person in any room? In a photograph, we all go and look for us. Staying in touch with your customer is absolutely vital. And we had Steve Head on last week, and he talked about texting your customers. So yesterday I text 20 people I hadn't heard of and uh, one of the person, one of the pe person uh, bought 50 of my books, wants it sent to the printers and they're going to send 50 of my books to their customers. So staying in touch, I was thinking that's a bit uh, odd, should I re really text someone on a Sunday? And I did and it worked. So make them feel important and uh, the person that sells more cars in America is a salesman in somewhere like Iowa who uh, stays in touch with every customer, sends birthday cards to all the family, etc. So they are looked after and loved because at the end of the day, it doesn't come down to price. It comes down to relationships when people are buying. Graham, the online world. How do you make the most of the online world? Well, one of the things that we've seen as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic is that there are some businesses who've struggled and they have struggled because the internet was a kind of thing that hang on the, hung on the side of their business. It wasn't central to their business. To make the most of the online world, the online world is central. This is what your business is. Your business is part of the internet. And the internet isn't just a tool you use to do your business. Your business is online. Whatever you do, 95% of everything that's bought in the world now is the journey for that purchase starts online. Even if it's some big project that's going to cost hundreds of millions, the journey for that starts online. And so we've witnessed many businesses who've kind of had the internet and the way the internet is used as part of IT and part of some subset of marketing somewhere. And everybody else in the business has kind of just not really been involved. The internet is central to the business. Whatever you do, whether you're a business coach, whether you're a professional speaker, whether you are a business consultant, those things are things that you do with real people in the real world, but you are only able to do those because you run that operation properly online. So the biggest thing that I think has really shook some companies in recent months is how important putting the internet as central to your business and everything else happens as a result of it. And that's where that mental attitude of changing the thinking from this is just a bit of technology we use to this is how I do my business becomes fundamental to making sure you succeed online. It's absolutely extraordinary, isn't it, what's happening? I couldn't believe there's, a, there's an online retailer in the UK that's worth twice the market cap of Marks and Spencers. I hadn't heard of it until two weeks ago, and it's called Boohoo. And the reason Boohoo's been so successful is they can make garments quickly, locally, and they can change their strategy immediately on the internet. So they were selling track suits and joggers to people that didn't have them as soon as we ran into, uh, ran into those issues. So it was being fast on their feet, changing things 
on the internet. And the final one down here is body language. Everyone seems to be fascinated in body language. I've always thought that body language was quite uh, obvious, but of course it's uh, the obvious things aren't obvious to everybody. And of course it depends basically on people's level of emotional intelligence, whether they're picking up the signals, whether they have high sensory awareness. But of course, sensory awareness can be learned. You start listening to what people say, how they say it, watching when people are uncomfortable, watching when they fold their arms and they move back, watching when they go a little bit red in the face from embarrassments, watching as they take their glasses off and start thinking about that uh, difficult question, uh, watching when they uh, do that as they answer the question, looking up for some sort of divine intervention. And by the way, some of this body language works everywhere around the world, whatever the religion. Watching when they put a steeply, really confident gesture out there. Watching when they rub their ears because they're not quite sure of what you're saying, but looking for the real clues. Remembering it's five times more difficult to lie, tell fibs, spin things. It is with the body language, unless you're, uh, you're the prime minister of a country or the president of a country and you've been trained and coached in how to do that, or you are a professional person that spins things, but generally there's little giveaway signals. The Prime Minister of the UK, three removed, his blink rate went up when he was uncomfortable. He'd been coached by all the NLPers, but the blink rate went up like mad. And of course, we all know over the last 500 years, we called people blinking liars. Why did we call them blinking liars? Because somebody must have mo meant, mo noticed at some stage that their blink rate went up like mad. Crucially important subject, body language, because you need to understand the body language to make sure you don't get conned, you do the right deal. If people are working for you and they promise to do something and yet they give you uh, offhand body language, then that's really tricky. So read it, understand it, interpret it and ask other questions. Well, they're the 17 subjects that, uh, that we cover. We're adding to those because we're going to cut them down from 17 minutes to 12 minutes. The next uh, session's in November. So do tell people about it. Do tell your kids. Do tell uh, your friends and your colleagues. And uh, email us at uh, www. Top, uh, there's too many W's there. Topmasterclass.co.uk uh, uh, and uh, join us. The tongue's got tied to the top of my mouth, I think. So uh, thanks for joining us. We'll answer any questions off, uh, off screen. Graham, uh, one last thought from you. I'll just say to add to the, the body language stuff, there is some, uh, some real science behind it. The reason people will scratch their nose or scratch their ears is because they are anxious. And one of the things that happens in anxiety is that uh, changes to our hormonal system happen in, in microseconds and in those microseconds what happens is your peripheral blood flow increases dramatically and that means that what happens is your ears and your nose are the extremities get very hot and so what happens is they get immediately hot and you become irritated by it uh, equally your eyes start to dry out and you blink more in order to so the the the, the whole way that if you're anxious because you you know you're telling a fib, but actually what happens is in microseconds, the uh, body changes the hormones and that changes blood flow. And that's the reason why people scratch their extremities when they are telling a fib. Thanks a lot, Graham. Thanks to everybody for uh, watching us today. And uh, we look forward to meeting you shortly.